myself. My name is Bhumi Patel and uh, I work with the business development team in Uganda uh, and will be the moderator for this interactive session. Allow me to invite our keynote speaker to say a few words to initiate this webinar. He is a senior partner at Grand Thornton, Uganda, providing tax advisory and assurance services. He brings on board 25 years of professional experience, including 15 years in Uganda. He has been advising several domestic and multinational companies and their stakeholders on requirements such as tax and advisory matters. His experience mainly evolves around both private and public sector and many industries such as agribusiness, banking, insurance, NGOs, construction and real estate, oil and gas. Please allow, please join me to invite Jasmine Shah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bumi, for uh, a good introduction. Good morning, everyone. I, on behalf of the leadership team at Grand Thornton, Uganda, would like to welcome you all uh, to today's uh, transfer pricing webinar. We hope that you all are well and keeping safe and we pray to the almighty God that you, your colleagues and family remain safe and healthy in these difficult times. As our economy recovers from the second wave of the pandemic in Uganda, we thought it's suitable to engage with our clients, teams, markets and well wishes that is all of you to increase the awareness on a topic that isn't well known to many, yet it is extremely important. Transfer pricing from a conceptual and regulatory uh, standpoint requires both compliance as well as sufficient analysis to ensure that the transactions with related parties that take place in a way that will not have adverse implications to your company's brand cause for penalties as well as ensure that all your transactions are feasible from an economic perspective. This webinar is aimed at providing all of our viewers a better understanding on the genesis of transfer pricing, who is impacted, what is required by law, as well as delving into the technical aspects of transfer pricing within the limited time what we have in this webinar and look at the methods which are applied and why. Our presenter today is uh, Andrew Chintu. Andrew Chintu is a transfer pricing expert at Grand Thornton, Uganda, and he's an amazing uh, young leader. And he has also won Emerging Leader of the Year Award from Grand Thornton International from the competition of about 39,000 people in 2019. Andrew and his team has significant experience in transfer pricing over a period of time, and we hope that he will be able to deliver uh, this webinar to his best, and you will enjoy this and enrich your knowledge on transfer pricing. I once again want to thank you all for joining us and supporting Grand Thornton Uganda. As uh, Bumi has stated, that there will be a Q&A session at the end and if you still have any quest, uh, queries which we are unable to answer in this webinar, we would request that you can always get in touch with us uh, and we would be more than happy to serve you as always. With these brief remarks, I would like to open this uh, webinar and uh, invite Andrew to, to take all of us through uh, this uh, complex topic of uh, transfer pricing. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jasmine. Thank you very much, Bumi, for that introduction. I hope I am audible to everyone. Um, for the benefits of ensuring that the webinar is conducted with very little network issues, allow me to switch my webcam off and we can delve into the webinar content. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you and thank you very much for joining us today. The topic we're going to discuss is relatively complex and technical, but I am going to try as much as possible to ensure that this complex topic of transfer pricing is simplified in such a way that even for those who have just come across this term for the first time, you will leave this webinar with sufficient and basic information required for you to know what it means to be compliant, how to check 
that your company is compliant and what documentations are required to be maintained to ensure that your organization is on the right side of the law. As mentioned, we will have a Q&A session and during that session we will be able to go over any questions you may have. So as introduced, we're going to discuss the genesis of transfer pricing. We're going to look at the legal framework in Uganda. We're going to define what an arm's length principle is. We're going to go over the different benchmarking methodologies in terms of the hierarchies, what they mean, why we use them, when we use them. And finally, we'll look at the documentation requirements that need to be maintained by companies that are impacted by this transfer pricing uh, regulations. So going into the genesis of transfer pricing, allow me to share with you a brief video which can introduce the concept, give you a highlight of where transfer pricing originated. Just to inform you, transfer pricing is not only native to Uganda or Africa, it's a global issue and it was it's one of the many measures that were taken by the International Organization for Economic Development to ensure that there is equality and fair payment of taxes by all companies. But the video I'm going to show you, it's just a two minute video. It will give you a brief genesis of the same. Does Apple Inc. own directly or indirectly AOI, AOE, and ASI? Yes. And where is AOI a tax resident? It does not have a tax residency. You know, we're talking about 10 to 15 percent of the world's financial wealth basically being invested offshore beyond the reach of tax authorities. So far from being a success story, I regard the city of London as the world's biggest tax haven. Can you tell me how many subsidiary companies of your group are incorporated and operating in the Cayman Islands? Uh, I don't have that number with me either. You have 181. There are $1.6 trillion booked to Cayman Islands banks. Almost none of that is actually in Cayman. Many politicians have an illusion that they actually run their country when actually they run their country within the confines that the global financial system places on. There was a period before we had a welfare state. We had the welfare state under a certain set of conditions, and those conditions have changed. This social contract is broken. People didn't invest money into services. I mean, you look at the state of the roads here, the most basic thing, and there's potholes everywhere. Property tax are introducing, water tax, all these new taxes, personal taxes. What's different about Google, we're not selling books and we're not uh, making we're coffee. The consumers are based on the computer science. That is what creates the economic uh, value uh, for What Google. does Bermuda create? Kodak had hundreds of thousands of employees, really good, solid middle-class jobs. The new world of photography is Instagram, which had 13 employees and sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. Les entreprises meurent sous l'effet de cette révolution industrielle et cessent de payer des impôts. Et puis la marge se déplace vers les paradis fiscaux. At some point, more inequality is not simply more inequality. It needs another name. People are being expelled from livelihoods. We are the 99%. We are the 99%. People used to, in their positions, use that money to invest in our country, to invest in people, and they're not doing it anymore. And as a nurse, I would say they're probably a little bit mentally ill. It's not normal to want to hoard all that money. And the people in this country need it. We pay all the tax you require us to pay in the UK. We paid six billion yeah, maybe of tax last year. We're not year. accusing you of being illegal. We're accusing you of being immoral. So from that video, just to point out, there were companies like Apple, companies like Google, all these companies operate in multiple countries and they have revenue coming from very many economies. But then the taxes they pay, for example, uh, from the screen, you can see that Starbucks uh, is operating from the UK and making 398 million pounds in 2011, but it paid zero corporation tax. And the examples are limitless. So from a 
brand perspective, transferring profits to from one economy where the taxes are high or where they should be paying taxes to countries like take tax havens like Dubai, like Mauritius, um, that in the long run damages the reputation of a company. So in the news, you will see where transfer pricing originated from these big multinational companies. But then you will also find that as your organization grows, it is inevitable that you will have sometimes a group of companies operating within the same country, as we will see in the latter part of this presentation, or you have operations in Rwanda, operations in Kenya, operations in other parts of the world. Now, to make sure that you remain compliant, to make sure that you remain transacting as if two companies that are not related, that is what transfer pricing is. That is the background of transfer pricing. Now, from what is required, the Organization of Economic Development has come up with measures and the next video is just going to highlight a brief on what is required for companies that are operating in multinational uh, entities. And this will highlight where, where it is we're going to drive our conversation. The OECD G20 BEPS project calls for new country-by-country -country reporting requirements, which will have major impacts on transparency of multinational enterprises and their operations. For example, companies A, B, and C belong to the same group. The parent is a holding company that is tax resident in, say, Spain. The group carries out research and development in, for instance, Turkey. Manufacturing may be done in Brazil. Sales are routed through a company that may be based in Panama, which also holds the group's intellectual property. Tax administrations in Turkey, Brazil, and Spain have no access to specific information on the group and may be unable to determine where profits are reported for tax purposes. The lack of data makes it difficult for authorities to carry out transfer pricing assessments on transactions between linked companies, and even harder to carry out audits. What's the solution? Changes to the transfer pricing guidelines and to domestic laws will oblige parent companies to file in their home country a new country-by-country -country reporting template providing a clear overview of where profits, sales, employees and assets are located and where taxes are paid and accrued. Tax authorities will then share this information with jurisdictions where the multinational operates pursuant to tax treaties. All right, so now that we have the background, let's just go over a few of the terminology that you might have come across in those videos. The first one being BEPS. So transfer pricing is one of the 14 BEPS measures that was part of the o Organization for Economic Development Strategy. And what and what the BEPS are, the first part BE stands for base erosion, where companies use financial measures and tax planning to reduce their taxable profits. So this is where companies have strategies to avoid taxes, not necessarily to evade taxes. And then the second portion of profit shifting is when companies make payments to other entities in order to move profits from one high tax paying economy to a low tax paying economy or shifting to a company that has allowable uh, tax losses or complete tax exemptions. In Uganda, we're all aware that the Uganda Investment Authority or the URA have come up with strategies that are set to encourage investment. So if a Ugandan or if invest say $1 million, you have an income tax holiday, you can get an income tax holiday for up to 10 years. Or if a, a, a foreign company invests a certain amount of money 
if you are part of a group and you have one of your entities that is completely exempt from income tax, what happens with profit shifting is you will move your profits from the company that doesn't have the tax holiday to a company that has a tax holiday. Or if you're transferring the profits out of Uganda, you have a company where the parent company is sitting, say, in the Cayman Islands, and you will transfer the profits from Uganda where the income tax is 30% to a country where, like Cayman Islands, where the income tax is 0%. So that's what they call profit shifting. So how can multinationals transfer profits? The big question. So what are the some of the transactions that multinational companies have that they use to transfer profits from one company to another? The first payment of payment for intellectual properties like royalty fees. In the in the first video you watched, um, Google is paying royalty fees or Apple is paying uh, for intellectual property in countries where the business is not actually generating money, but because the, the parent company is registered in those countries and those countries are tax holidays, you pay a huge sum. Sometimes it could be a percentage of your revenue to those countries as a way of transferring profits there so that you do not have to pay taxes. Paying for using brand. We all know about trademark fees. Provision of loans. Now with loans, it's so interesting. For example, right now, a, a US dollar loan in Uganda is between 8% and 12%. If you get a loan from a related party in dollar terms and you are paying 25% interest, that means your transaction is not happening within the market range. You are transferring an excess of 13% to your related party so that you don't have to pay uh, the taxes on that money. Sometimes it could also be that through direct sale of products and services. For example, if I am selling uh, notebooks as my product and I sell to my related party at a price that is lower than what I'm selling to the market so that they are the ones who make the profit and I make a loss on that transaction. That is me transferring the profits to them. And we're going to look at all the different ways and which method is applicable in analyzing if the transaction is at arm's length. As I mentioned earlier, percentage of percentage on sales, this could be through provision of management or administrative services or operate, providing operating and maintenance uh, services for companies where these transactions are uh, applicable. So there's many strategies, but then all tax regular all tax bodies across the world are coming aware and aware of these strategies and they're combating them through these uh, transfer pricing mechanisms. So let's get over the key definitions. Number one, what is a transfer price? A transfer price is the price at which one entity transacts with a related party. The arm's length principle means that transactions between a con within a controlled environment have to be the same as transactions between independent parties. So meaning transactions between two companies of the same group have to be the same as transactions between two companies that have no relation to each other. Transfer pricing is the practice of establishing the arm's length prices for associated entities across or for cross-border transactions. Benchmarking, which is a process that we do as a part of transfer pricing, is the in-depth study to compare the transactions between associate entities and independent entities to test the arm's length nature of these transactions. A control transaction, you're going to be hearing me using these last two terms a lot. A control transaction is between related parties and an uncontrolled transaction is one that happens between independent parties. So why is transfer pricing relevant? The main objective is to ensure that transactions happen in the same way or at the same price as if the transaction was happening between unrelated parties. In that way, every entity will be paying their, their fair share of taxes in the jurisdictions where they are operating. The secondary objective for transfer pricing as a practice, number one, is to ensure that, trans that, that companies are in compliance with transfer pricing regulations so that they don't have consequences in future because non-compliance of the of the regulations in place can lead to 
dangerous consequences, brand damage, banned from operating in certain markets, not to mention the penalties. And the penalties, I'm going to give you full details when we look at the regulations in Uganda. So what's the call for action? Number one is companies have to determine the proper transfer prices for their transactions. They have to make sure that the resulting allocation of income reflects the underlying economic activities. What does that mean? If the company that is bearing the risk, if the company that is performing the most functions in a transaction, if the company that is the owner or ultimate owner of the assets being used in a transaction, this company is the one that has to be receiving the most income. To give an example, if I have a company operating in Mauritius, but in Mauritius, there's only a staff of two people, for example, and it's a service company. But then in Uganda, I have a team of 50 people. And of these 50 people, I transfer all the profits to Mauritius. That means that my allocation of the income that we have made does not reflect the underlying economic activities. The third point is to reach cross-border agreements between uh, between different tax jurisdictions to ensure that proper pricing amongst taxpayers and the affected countries. And finally, is to maintain the sufficient documents to ensure compliance. And these documents we're going to talk about. Let's look at the, the legal framework in Uganda. So the first citing of transfer pricing is within the Income Tax Act, Section 90, which states the transactions between uh, associates have to be the way it's, uh, section 90 subsection 1 as on the screen states that in a transaction between tran taxpayers who are associates or under employment or relation the commissioner may distribute or apportion incomes deductions credits between the taxpayers to reflect the chargeable income in the taxpayers who have the realized the arm's length transaction. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of what this means later on. But after the Income Tax Act, the URA in 2011 also enacted the transfer pricing regulations. And all of these are in line with the OECD uh, guidelines and they applied using the OECD methodology. As I mentioned at the start of this, transfer pricing is not native to Uganda alone. It is cuts across all countries across the world. Everyone is ensuring that the fair share of taxes is paid. So who is affected from the regulatory perspective? Number one, transactions between branches and headquarters, because obviously a branch is an associated entity because it is controlled or influenced by the parent company. Transactions where both parties are residents in Uganda and they're related, we'll give examples of that. Transactions between associates, between associates who are one entity in Uganda and another outside Uganda. If your company or if your group of companies falls under any of these three subdivisions, then you are affected. What is the definition of an associate as per the regulations? An associate includes any person, which is an individual or an entity, who is not an employee, but acts in accordance, directions, requests, suggestions or wishes of another person. So what that means is if you have more than 50% shareholding or if your company influences the decisions of my company, then I am your associate. And the examples of associate transactions include transfer of goods, financial transactions, loans and guarantees, provision of services such as management, operating and maintenance, as well as transfer of intangible assets and tangible assets. What are the penalties? I told you I'll get to this. So the law states that failure to comply with the documentation requirements is an offense and on conviction, a person is liable to imprisonment for a period not exceeding six months and a fine equivalent or not exceeding 25 currency points, which is equivalent to $500. Now, I think after the URA enacted this, they came in at a later stage and amended. And in addition to the above penalties, in the tax procedures code section 49A, it states that failure to provide the requested documentation will result into a penalty not exceeding 50 million. So they, exceed, they increased that fine from 500,000 
to 50 million. Now let's look at what an arm's length principle is. I hope I am not moving too fast, but considering that the time we have is limited and we have a lot to cover, you forgive me if I am uh, moving quickly. If you do have any questions, just a reminder, do write them in our chat and we'll be able to attend to them after this session. The arm's length principle, as for the OECD, is defined as entities that are related via management control or capital in their transactions with associate entities or control transactions, which I mentioned before, should agree the same terms and conditions which would have been agreed between unassociated entities for comparable and controlled transactions. And how do we determine this? Now we're going into the technical aspects of transfer pricing. So before I go into this technical side, I'm going to just have a small recap. Number one, transfer pricing up is not native to Uganda. It cuts across the world. Number two, if, you if you're part of a group of companies, if you have associate entities, whether you're not operating in the same tax jurisdiction. So it doesn't mean that you have to be in Uganda and Kenya. Two companies can be in Uganda, but through tax avoidance strategies, you can transfer profits from one company to another, which has a tax holiday or brought forward tax losses, which are deductible as per the uh, tax law. So those are the people who are affected. The penalties have been highlighted. It's a penalty of 50 million if you do not have the documentation or imprisonment. And essentially non-compliance or it is an immoral act. It might not necessarily be illegal, but it is immoral. And the, the, the concept of immorality comes in that where you are generating your income, where you are generating your profits, it's only fair that you pay your sh fair share of taxes in those economies so that the, the, the countries can develop. Now, when we're determining the arm's length principle, we say that transactions between two companies who are related has to be the same as transactions between two companies that are not related. And how we determine this, now we're going into the technical sides. We have two sets of methods. The first set of methods is what we call the tra traditional transaction methods. And these are the most common methods and the most preferred by most tax bodies. The first method is a comparable and controlled price. The second method is the resale price method. The third method is the cost plus method. And then we move to the transactional profit method, which look at the transaction net margin method, the transactional profit split method. In this hierarchy, the OECD stipulates that the hierarchy must be followed. What this means is when you're determining the arm's length principle, you always have to go through the CUP method first, then the RPM, then the cost plus method, then you move to the profit methods, which is TNMM and TPSM. But we're going to dwell into what each method means now. As I, meant, as I mentioned, these are the, this is the hierarchy. So the comparable uncontrolled price method, it compares the price charged between associate entities and the price charged between independent parties. I will emphasize the comparable uncontrolled price. It compares the price. So if I am buying a bottle of water at 1000 from a related party, under this method, I'm going to compare the price. I would have bought that same bottle with the same quantity, same design, same raw materials, I will compare the price that I'll buy that, that same item at. So the CUP method, it looks at the price. The resale price method, it compares the resale price or it compares transactions for which there is no value addition. What does that mean? We all know that we have companies that import and then resale. So if I have a company operating in India, and I'm importing tiles and I'm selling in Uganda. That means I am importing those tiles and I'm selling them into the market without any value addition. The resale price method, it looks at the prices that when I'm doing my reselling, where is the price difference between when I'm selling to related parties or non-related parties? And what happens with the resale price method is we look at what we call the gross margin, but we're going to look at that at a later stage. 
The third method is the cost plus method, which looks at the markup on costs between associate entities and between non-associate entities. This is very common in service companies. For example, as Grant Thornton, we provide management services as an example. If we incur costs of 1 million, and when we're selling to a company that is not related to Grand Fountain, we add a markup of 10%. So meaning we charge that company 1.1 million. If we are charging a related party, but charging our related party a markup of 3%, that means we'll be ch charging that related party 1,030,000. That means that transaction is not at arm's length. So with the CUP method, we're comparing what we call the markup on the transact, on the costs, sorry. The fourth method in the hierarchy is the transaction net margin method. Now, what happens with the net margin method? It compares the level of profit which would have resulted between associate entities and non-associate entities. Now, you would ask me, why would we look at profit? Because there's so many moving pieces on the financial statement. Now, most cases, what would happen is, if you cannot apply the first method or the second method or the third method, We'll look at the reasons why they wouldn't be applicable. What the URA says, fine. If you do not have sufficient information to use the first three methods, let us look that if you are operating in the, in the steel manufacturing sector and you are making an operating profit of 3%, but yet other companies operating in the same sector, they are making an operating profit of 30%. That means your, your company from the related party transactions that you've had, you've been transferring profits outside. So that is what the transaction net margin method looks at. It looks at the profits you are making at the end of the day. With the transaction profit split method, the way it works is, remember when we talked about trans ensuring that allocation of income happens or reflects the economic, the underlying economic activity. So with this last method, which is very, very rarely used, what happens is if there are five companies that are all related and say they're constructing a building, and then after that building is sold, they split the profit. This method looks to ensure that the, the split of that profit is equivalent to the contribution or the economic uh, addition that every company that um, every related party company contributed to constructing this building. So, for example, if your company provided cement and cement was 40% of the entire project, when we are splitting the profits at the end of the day, but you take 70% profit and yet your raw materials were only 40%, that means we're not allocating the profits correctly. So that is a transaction profit split method. It is very rarely applicable because it's mostly used when there's complex transactions. Now, aside from these five methods, the transfer pricing regulations allows for a fifth method, which is called the other methods. And the other method means we look at other qualitative factors that might not necessarily be inherent or readily available in the information that is given. So that means we'll look at other factors, for example, which stage of the life cycle is the organization at, for example, if I am a new company and I am a startup, chances are high my operating profit is not going to be in the range or in the market range of the market. So if I use the transaction net method, the transaction is not at arm's length. But then if I use the other methods, I can justify the profits that I made. So now let's go into each method in particular and we explain it. Back to the CUP. This method compares the price charge. We've gone over that. But this method, I, it is very important to note, this is the most direct and the most reliable way to, uh, to check or to apply the arm's length principle. When the CUP method, when we're comparing, the information has to be in a way that it is absolutely comparable, meaning there shouldn't be any difference in transactions that could materially affect the price in the open market. I'll give you an example. If I am a tile manufacturing company and I am selling to a related party, but my related party is buying 80% of my total production, 
chances are high that my prices are going to be lower because my customer is buying in bulk. Now, if I have a customer who's building one house and he comes and buys tiles on one day in the year, that when you compare the price when I'm selling to my related party who is a distributor and when I'm selling to this final customer who is just building his house, there will be a price difference. So when you're applying the CUP method, the, the nature of transactions, there shouldn't be any, any material differences that could affect the price. Then number two, if there are material differences, then the, there has to be reasonably accurate adjustments that are made to eliminate them. For example, in the same example that I have given, most cases what we use is what we call the company's discount policy. So if a company has a discount policy in place, it will clearly highlight that, look here, if you're buying over 100 metric tons, we give you a discount of 5% on all our prices. So meaning even if it was a third party who came in and bought at that price, what would happen is we would be able to give them that same discount and they would be at the same price as our related party. So that is the CEP method and it is the most preferred method. When you go to URA, the first thing they'll ask you for is bring the invoices, let us compare. Because when you look at the invoices, you will be able to look at the prices for one item with the prices for another item. That is the CEP method. To give an example, the price sold to associate entities is 100,000, but then to an independent party, it is 120,000. The selling price above could be justified, as I mentioned, is because of the bulk, a discount was extended. But then there could be other, other issues instead of a bulk. It could be that the company is paying an advance. We're all trading, for example, during this COVID time, there's so many companies that are asking for credit. Now, if I'm extending to you credit, chances are high, I'm going to give you at a price that will be more favorable to me to make up for all those uh, for all that time as you hold my money, say 90 days. So meaning if you are paying me in advance, even before I give you my item, I most probably might give you a discounted price. So having the policies in place, in the example of the bulk, having a discount policy, which states if you buy in bulk, if you pay in good terms, or if what for whatever reason that would benefit me, you are doing things that will favor my operations, and that would encourage me to give you a discount. This all has to be within the discount policy, and it has to be applicable or freely available to independent parties as well. When we're comparing using the CEP method, we can either use what we call the internal comparables or the external comparables. Now, internal comparables means I am, I am the same company, I am selling to independent party as well as I'm selling to an associate. So they would compare the, the, the transactions between the two. However, with external comparables, we'll compare that, okay, if I go to the open market and I buy Panadol, and the price in the market is say 5,000 shillings. We're going to compare the same between two independent, two associate entities that are also trading the same exact product. So with external comparables, we're using external transactions that happen between entities that are not related. For example, Andrew Chintu went and took a loan from the bank, they gave him 15%, and then Mr. Jasmine got a loan from an associate entities, but he got his loan at 30%. So that is an external comparable. And at that, you can clearly tell that the transaction is not at arm's length. I hope the CEP method is clear. Now coming to the second method, which is the resale price method. The resale price method is where an entity is buys a product from a related party and sells it to the market without any value addition. Meaning you are buying an apple and selling an apple. If you buy an apple and make apple juice, then you cannot use the resale price method. That is where the element of hierarchy comes in. As I mentioned, you have to go through every method to test if your transaction is at arm's length or not. And when a method is not applicable due to inavailability of information, uh, absence of internal or external comparables, then you move to the next method. But you need to clearly state that I have rejected CUP because we don't have any comparable information. When I moved to RPM, was I buying and reselling? If yes, you can use RPM. If not, if you are buying, adding value and selling, that means you cannot use RPM. RPM is normally done 
in the distributing transactions. And as I mentioned to you, with RPM, we are going to compare the gross profit. So meaning we're going to look at the gross profit you've made from the illustration on the screen. I have bought at 600, I have sold at 1000, I've made a profit of 400. Now we go and use a benchmarking software where we're going to look at 100 million companies and we're going to say that, okay, let us find all the companies that are doing distribution of furniture in the world or in, in countries with similar economic uh, conditions. So developing economies for the case of Uganda. When we look at the companies that are distributing furniture in those countries, we then learn that what is the expected or what is the market range for the gross profit that a distributing company earns. When you learn that uh, profit margin, then you compare it to the profit margin that your distributor in the transaction you're analyzing is making. In this case, what normally happens is, or what is very important to note, is we're comparing this from the financial statement perspective. We're not looking at the actual price of the transactions. Now, when we move to the markup or the cost plus method, the cost plus method looks at the total costs that you have incurred when providing a certain item and what markup did you apply. Now, the way we compare it using the financial statements, the markup for any transaction is the gross profit over the direct costs because the gross profit over the direct costs will clearly show you how much margin did you apply on your total cost of production to earn that. And the same thing that we did with uh, resale price method, we will then compare that markup with the markup uh, applied by companies that are doing the same uh, function. With the transaction net margin method, we go a line lower in the financial statements. Now, if I am comparing with companies in India, for example, what normally happens is you will find the depreciation or not depreciation, or you will find that human resource or your total labor cost is being categorized differently. So because of the differences in the categorization of, of, of financial statement items, you, you will then resolve to use the operating profit matrix as the comparable figure because the gross profit of another company might include certain costs which you are considering as indirect expenses. So in the case of the illustration on the screen, this company has under an, an operating profit margin of 20%. We then look at what is the operating profit margin in this industry. So that is how the TNMM method works. And finally, with the transaction profit split method, what happens is two companies contribute to a control transaction and then they share the profit. We need to ensure that the sharing of the profit was in the exact same ratio as the contribution to the to the transaction. So meaning this method is very, very complex. You will find, for example, if I am making furniture, but one company is doing polishing, one company is doing the woodworks, one company is doing the marketing, another company is doing the bolts and the nuts, and the other company is doing, say, the accounting and handling the administrative functions in the in the selling in this business so if they're different companies all making contribution to this transaction we look at the ratio of those contributions and then we share the profits accordingly now the element of the tested party as i mentioned with cup we're looking at prices so there's no tested party when it comes to cup however with all these other transaction methods, all these other benchmarking methods where we're looking at profitability, it's very important to know which company do you test, which is what we call the tested party. So what I mean to say is, if I am in the uh, distribution of tiles and I am importing and I am selling in Uganda, how do we know which company to benchmark? Do we benchmark the company in India, which uh, is the one that is selling to me the tiles, or do we benchmark the company in Uganda? This is how we pick the tested party. Number one, we have to pick the company which the method can be applied in the most reliable manner, meaning all the financial information has to be available. So in most cases, you will find that some companies in the transactions, they do not have that information readily available or they do not wish to disclose it. So we'll always end up using the company whose information is most available. Number two, the company with the most reliable comparables it could be comparables in Uganda, comparables in nature of transactions, comparables in terms of how similar we can get the external benchmarking data. 
Number three, we take the company that is performing the less complex function. Because with the less complex function, that means there's less moving pieces and we can accurately make fewer adjustments in the computation in the computations where needed. So in a nutshell to summarize, when you're using CUP, there's no tested party. When you're using resale price method, the tested party is often the distributor. When you're using the cost plus method, the tested party is the individual who's providing the service, the manufacturer or the service provider. When you're using transaction net margin method, the tested party could be either or, whichever one has the financial information available. And then with the transaction profit split method, both parties are tested because they're both con contributing and it's a two-sided method. So finally, we now know the genesis, we know the regulations, we know the methods, what, doc, what, is the, what are the documentation requirements in Uganda? Before we discuss the documentation requirements, the, the guidelines provided by URA are the following. Number one, it must be in writing. So meaning you cannot say we have an understanding of a phone call or an, or an email. No, there has to be a sufficient document in writing. It must be sufficient enough to confirm the transfer prices at arm's length, meaning the document that you have to present to the URA has to clearly show that, look here, when we're selling to our, rela our related party, this was the price. When we're selling to a, a third party, this was the price. All this is the method we have used to benchmark, and this is how we confirm that the transaction was, was at arm's length. It must analyze the controlled transactions. Now, this is a very important aspect. Number one, your document clearly has to give a description of the business, your functional asset and risk analysis, your economic and comparability analysis. What do these mean? The business description clearly states that my company is a trading company. So if my company is a trading company, chances are high I'm only going to compare with other trading companies. Meaning if I am a company who is dealing and trading in tiles, I do not want to compare with a company that is manufacturing and trading tiles because then because of the manufacturing element in that company, then there's no comparability between us. So the business description is very important. The functional analysis means in the related party transaction, who does what? Who is the one that sources the suppliers? Who manages the movement of the items? Who stocks the inventory? Who takes on the risk? That is the risk analysis. And who, whose assets are we using in the transaction? That is all the analysis that is required. Now, the fourth requirement is that transfer pricing documentation must be prepared and updated every year. Because you earn income every year and because you pay taxes every year, the URA is very interested to know that, okay, for the year that ended June 2021, these are the transactions I had with my related party and this uh, is the benchmarking I have done to confirm that they were at arm's length. And next year, you have to prepare a new document for the transactions that will happen between July 21 and July, uh, June 22. When must this document be prepared? It has to be prepared and ready before the due date of filing your final income taxes. So meaning if your year end is June, you have to make sure that your transfer pricing documentation is ready by December and it must be available on request. The persons required to prepare the transfer pricing documentation are mainly multinational entities. So as I said, it's mostly to do with multinational entities because of the element of transferring profits from one economy that has high taxes to an, econ an economy that has low taxes. But it also applies in Uganda's case, it applies to companies both in Uganda where the transactions between related parties exceed 500 million. So meaning if my related party is in Rwanda and I'm in Uganda and our transaction was $10,000, I have to make the document. But if both related parties were in Uganda, our transactions have to exceed 500 million. That is when it is required. Now, there is a lot of confusion between what is a transfer pricing policy, what is a transfer pricing study. From the best practice perspective, a transfer pricing policy 
is a document that is prepared at the beginning before the related party transactions take place. And this document outlines the guidelines to be followed whilst transacting. What does this mean? When you incorporate your company, it is now an associate entity. You make a transfer pricing policy and you say, when we are paying for management services from our parent company, we are going to use the CUP method to test the markup that the parent company will charge to us. That is what the transfer pricing policy is. The transfer pricing policy also states how the transactions will be managed. This document is prepared once and is only changed if the nature of transactions change. So if at the beginning our only transaction is a loan and then next year we are buying and selling products, that means we will have to revise our policy. However, there comes a second document which is called the transfer pricing study. Now, the transfer pricing study comes in and looks at the particular financial period. And we see that during this year, these are the transactions we had. This is the method we applied. These are the outcomes of the benchmark. And this is the conclusion that our transactions were at arm's length. With a transfer pricing policy, it will just say, these are the transactions we will have. And this is how we will benchmark the transactions. It does not have a conclusion. It does not have an actual benchmark. Then finally, in addition to the policy and the study, organizations, and this goes to all of you, you have to maintain sufficient evidence and supporting documents. For example, if your transaction is a loan, there must be a loan agreement in place, which states the amount, the repayment terms, the interest rate, if your transaction is a distribution transaction, there has to be a distributor's agreement in place. If your transaction is a service transaction, there has to be a, a contract in place. If your transaction is a trademark or you're paying for brand uh, for, for, for using a brand and you're paying trademark fees, there has to be a, a, a royalty agreement in place. The other documents that need to be maintained are the invoices for example, because if you're using the CUP method, you definitely look at one invoice with a related party with another invoice between uh, with a third party. So to summarize, the transfer pricing regulations within the TP policy and the TP study, you have to summarize which regulations are we following? Why? Because every country has a bit of customizations or a bit of requirements. For example, Uganda, the threshold is 500 million if two entities are in the country, but for other countries, it could be a lower threshold or a higher threshold, or it could not be required. So it is very important to highlight which regulations are you following when making your document. As I mentioned, the transfer pricing policy, because it is prepared before, it must highlight what is the role of the key management, meaning your internal auditors, your accountants, your board, your board will approve, your internal auditors will review, your accountants will maintain the documents. The shareholding structure is very, very important because with the shareholding structure, what happens is, what, with the shareholding structure, what happens is it clearly highlights that this is how we're related. So essentially what happens is the shareholding structure is required in both documents. The business overview is also required in both documents. Now, the industry analysis is done to, to detail the economic times, the, all the economic conditions at the time of the transaction. Um, the value of the transactions will definitely not be in the policy because the policy is prepared before the transactions, but the value of transactions has to be in the study. The functional asset and risk analysis has to be in both documents. The selection of the method, as well as the transfer pricing analysis, of the for the intercompany transaction has to be in both documents and then finally the details of the selection of the comparable companies this will only be in the tp study as and when the transaction happens so in a nutshell we've covered the genesis we've covered who is impacted we've covered the regulations we've covered the different methods that are applicable and how we apply each method and also detailed the transfer pricing documentation requirements and the best practices. Thank you so much. And the floor is open for questions. Bumi, if there are any questions that have come in, let us take five minutes to, to respond to maybe three or two or three questions. And for any questions that are not attended to, because we have used the chat function, 
best believe that we are going to respond to each question. And should you have any technical requirements to do a benchmark to prepare transfer pricing documentation, Grant Thornton doors are widely open and we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this very informative session. Definitely, let's head to the question and answer round. So we do have um, some quite um, good questions in our chat box. So let me begin with the first one. Um, we have a question from Vicky Pang. If A company is owned by son and B company is owned by father, this will come under related party stroke associated entities and will transfer pricing apply? Now, thank you very much for that question. If one company is owned by the son and the other company is owned by the father, will transfer pricing be applicable? Yes. And why do I say yes? Because what happens is at the end of the day, if these two individuals, if the father influences the transactions with his son, or if the son influences his transactions with his father, or ultimately speaking from the income perspective, from the income perspective at the end of the day, when they do lifting of the veil and discover that it's the same family or that they are associated. So in this case, their blood is a blood re relation. These are associate entities. So yes, they will have to have the transfer pricing documentation. However, from the technical perspective, in terms of the shareholding percentages of these companies, if there's no common shareholding, or if you find that this, the ultimate benefactor is different, in most cases, it might not be applicable. OK, thank you. I hope Vicky Pang has been um, answered. Another question from Emma. When do when do a transaction, when do you say a transaction is not at arm's length? I mean, the prices have to differ by what percentage from unrelated party transaction for it to be considered not to be at arm's length. What should be the percentage, oh sorry, acceptable percentage of price difference if you're selling between related and unrelated parties? Okay, so if you are selling between related and unrelated parties, as I mentioned, you're going to use the CUP method. Now, what would happen is the differences in the prices must be justifiable. What do I mean by this? If I I am importing tiles, I'll use a tiles example because it's the first one to come to mind. If I am uh, selling tiles to a related party and also selling tiles to a third party, if my related party is buying 90% or, or is always buying their, their, my items in bulk and is paying me in advance and my company's discounting policy clearly states that I can give up to a discount of 30 percent so there's no stipulation what matters is if there is another company that is transacting and buying in the same bulk paying in the same terms that prices have to be the same so that is why i'm saying that using the cup method it is the most reliable and most accurate however sometimes it's very difficult to find that you're selling to two bulk money uh, two bulk uh, customers so what would happen in that case is where you find that the prices are variant and there's no discounting policy in place, we then don't look at prices, we'll look at the profitability and compare whether it is the gross profit if, it, if you're doing distribution or if it is the operating profit if you're doing manufacturing. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next question um, is from Kwesiga. Kindly enumerate key challenges peculiar to the services industry in attaining compliance with the transfer pricing regulations. OK, the service industry. That's that's a very, very, very broad question and we'll probably have to uh, get it a bit narrower. But from from our practice and from our experience, what normally happens with service transactions is the level of comparability is very, very limited. What do I mean by this? Grant Thornton is an audit firm, but what happens is there is not two audit audits that are the same word for word. 
there will always be a difference in terms of the volume of work, the nature of expert, uh, the, the qualifications of experts involved, uh, the timing, the economic conditions. So when benchmarking services, it's very rare that you're going to use the CUP method. But what happens is the bottom line at the end of the day, the profitability between these two entities or the markup that is applied when giving or receiving services, it is normally comparable to the market. So from, from speaking from the benchmarking perspective, CUP is rarely applied on service uh, transactions and we normally use either the cost plus method or the transaction net method. I hope we have net transaction net margin method. I hope I've been able to um, give a broad response to that. However, I would request him to give a more detailed question if, if that hasn't been clearly clarified and we'll be able to attend to that. Sure. Um, another question is from Beatrice. If my financial year is done to December, when should the TP document for 2021 be ready? And when am I liable for penalty if it's not ready? As I say, the transfer pricing documentation must be ready at the time of filing your final income tax returns. So that means if your year end is December, your final income tax returns are June of the following year, June 2022. Now, when are you liable? The, the regulations do not require you to submit your transfer pricing documents in June. But while you're filing your returns and URA does their assessment, they will ask for your transfer pricing documentation. Upon request, you have exactly 30 days to provide the document before you're li liable to the penalty. So essentially, your document must be ready by June and must be made available before end of July. If end of July comes and you don't and you haven't presented your transfer pricing documentation, then you are liable to the penalty of 50 million. Thank you. Um, due to the timing um, issues, we have exceeded our uh, the timelines. I think we will have to stop here. For questions from Rob, um, Pius, and Mr. Himnab, can we please request you to please share with us um, um, these questions on our email, uh, which I'm just posting um, on the chat group so that we can answer them for you, definitely. Please feel free to call us as well. We are ready to answer them over the phone as well. Um, at this point, I would like to thank you all once again for sparing your valuable time to attend this training. We shall share this presentation um, in an email as well as upload this recording on our YouTube channel. Will this, um, I would like to encourage you to subscribe to our mailing list and as well as follow our social media platforms. That is LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube to receive our latest insights, alerts and webinar alerts, etc. We have an upcoming tax webinar in the second week of September on withholding tax regime. Please stay tuned to receive the registration link. Thank you once again, everyone, and have a great weekend.